Okay, uh, welcome everybody. This is our first video podcast of the term chapter 17 and we're going to discuss blood, its components, its role in human physiology and we're going to identify um, essentially the role blood plays in homeostasis. So we'll list the components of the cardiovascular system and describe important blood function. We'll describe the important components and properties of blood We'll explain the origins and differentiation of the formed elements. Those are the cellular components of blood. Um, basically, when we're talking about the cardiovascular system, um, we're talking about an important mechanism that the body has to deliver oxygen and nutrients to cells so that they can make enough energy to survive. What we have to understand is that over the course of evolution, life began in a relatively simple state in the form of single-celled organisms that um, essentially were able to absorb nutrients across their cell membrane and excrete waste uh, products back through that cell membrane and as a, as a result we didn't need a lot of modifications to cellular structure in order to carry those particular tasks out. Things were relatively simple but what happened is the earth began to change and the environment um, began to uh, become in some places um, drier, in some places more acidic. Essentially, as variety began to be introduced into the ecosystem, um, life had to either adapt or die. And as a result, um, the evolution of the circulatory system provides a route to get nutrients and oxygen to cells so that they can make sufficient ATP in order to continue life processes. So the cardiovascular system consists of a pump, which is the heart, that propels blood and maintains blood pressure, which is simply the force that the fluid exerts against the walls of the vessels, conducting tubes that we know as blood vessels. This is very important. Remember that arteries always carry blood away from the blood pump, the heart, and veins always carry blood back towards the heart. The capillaries are where um, most of the exchange takes place between the um, oxygen that's in the blood and the nutrients in the blood and the carbon dioxide and the waste products that are in the tissues. Okay, as a result, capillaries, as we're going to find out, are extremely delicate and um, perfectly designed for this exchange. However, one of the things that we have to appreciate is because they are so delicate they're also very easily damaged and so when we talk a little bit about um, conditions like hypertension uh, we'll address some of that. The veins return the blood to the heart and of course the fluid that they contain is the blood which transports all kinds of stuff um, nutrients, waste products, um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, hormones, a considerable amount of water and electrolytes um, it assists in thermoregulation so that we can maintain a relatively constant body temperature and it also helps us defend ourselves against disease um, in the form primarily of the leukocytes, the formed elements that we could think of as our disease defenders. Okay, um, this is just a short diagram of the cardiovascular system and you can see here the heart located behind the sternum and the mediastinum of the thoracic cavity and you can see the uh, systemic veins which are indicated here in blue and the systemic arteries which are indicated here in red. When we say systemic what we mean is supplying all the body tissues with the exception of the, uh, the lungs. Okay, The lungs have a very special um, circuit called the pulmonary circuit uh, which we'll get to when we talk about circulatory patterns a little bit later on in the course. Um, remember again that the veins always carry blood back to the heart, the arteries always carry blood away from the heart, and that the capillaries are the areas of gas exchange and nutrient and waste exchange. And basically if you look anywhere in the body um, you're going to find capillaries near most active tissue with a few exceptions. And then of course the blood 
is what's contained inside those vessels. It's made up of both formed elements, which are the cellular components of blood, which we'll discuss in just a moment, and also the plasma, which is the liquid component of blood. And then, of course, the heart, which is the main pump. This is how we drive the blood in one direction throughout the body. Okay, so what does blood allow to happen in human physiology? What, um, what does blood regulate? Well, it's important for the transportation of dissolved gases, nutrients, hormones, and metabolic waste products. It carries oxygen from the lungs to the peripheral tissues and carries carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs. And it also distributes nutrients from the digestive tract or from storage in adipose tissue or in the liver. It also carries chemical signals called hormones from the gland that secretes them, which we call endocrine glands, to their targets, which are defined by the presence of a receptor for that particular chemical. It also carries waste to the kidneys for excretion. And as a result, we can, we can appreciate now um, the importance of blood, right? Back to our discussion of, you know, the change in life, right? As, as, as the earth became um, more complex, as environments began to change, we had to adapt to these changing conditions or die. And the result, it was an evolution from single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms what happened as a result is that the more complicated the organism became, um, the more capable it was of adapting to the environment around it. Because what happened over time is that as we went from unicellular to multicellular life forms, um, different cells took on different specialized roles. They were very good at those roles, and as a result, the interdependence of these cells on each other formed the, the, the structural basis for the multicellular organism. Um, but again, we have a logistical problem, right? As the organism becomes more complex, more cellular, a lot of those cells are going to be far removed from the source of oxygen and from the source of food. And so unless we um, generate a delivery system, to get oxygen and nutrients to these cells, those cells are going to die. And so that's the basis for the evolution of the circulatory system. And we can see here, as a result of the, the job description of blood, how important this system is to our survival. What else does blood do for us? It helps regulate um, the pH and the ion composition of interstitial fluid. Remember the interstitial fluid is the fluid between cells. It absorbs and neutralizes acids generated by active tissue in the form of um, organic acids and carbon dioxide. It forms carbonic acid when it dissolves in water. Um, it also mediates um, diffusion between the blood and the interstitial fluid that allows us to balance ion concentration inside and outside the cell. It also restricts fluid loss at sites of injury because enzymes that initiate clotting will respond to damage to the vessel wall to form essentially a, a temporary block between where the injury is and the blood that's flowing through those vessels so that you don't hemorrhage, okay? And the result then eventually is that uh, once we seal off the break, um, we can affect... Um, tissue repair and regeneration and then eventually what will happen is that the blood clot will be dissolved and um, normal tissue function will be restored. The blood clot again is a temporary patch. Other functions of blood. It's a defense against toxins and pathogens. The white blood cells known as the leukocytes are transported by the blood and they migrate into peripheral tissue where they fight infection Antibodies, which are produced by special types of leukocytes called B cells, are transported by the blood to the area of where the pathogen is located or where the infected tissue is located. And what they're capable of doing is tagging the pathogen or tagging the infected cell for destruction by um, special types of lymphocytes called um, cytotoxic T cells. And the idea here is that 
um, we take out only those cells that um, display protein molecules on their surface that are unlike our own protein surface molecules because these would be essentially indicators of infection and as a result these antibodies that are produced can recognize these unusual molecules that are on the surface of infected cells or on the surface of pathogens and destroy them. Um, a working definition of a pathogen is um, any any entity that can produce disease. Okay, examples would be things like bacteria, viruses, fungi, uh, parasites, and um, viruses and toxins. Okay. It also helps stabilize our body temperature. The body absorbs the heat that's generated in one area of the body and distributes it to the other tissues. The blood flow is directed closer to the skin when the body temperature is high, and it's directed to the core when the body temperature is too low. Um, again, you've experienced this um, on a daily basis. If you've ever been outside on a hot day, what do you notice? You notice that your skin turns red and that you sweat. And the idea here is that um, as your body temperature is rising because the outside temperature is high, uh, what happens is that we have vasodilation of the capillaries near the skin surface that brings blood to the surface as we sweat the sweat dries as the sweat dries it cools the skin and as the skin cools it cools the blood and then that drops our temperature back down to normal okay now when we are describing all these different roles of blood it's obvious that there are going to have to be many factors uh, that contribute to blood's ability to carry out all of these different tasks. And so what we want to do now is delve into some of the components that make up blood. It is a fluid connective tissue. Now remember from ANP1 that a connective tissue is defined primarily as a tissue with very few cells and a lot of extracellular matrix. And in the case of blood, the extracellular matrix is the plasma. And it's primarily the extracellular matrix in connective tissue that defines its job. In blood, um, its job is defined both by the formed elements, the cellular component, and the liquid. It consists of plasma, which is the liquid matrix, and the formed elements, which are the cells and the cell fragments. The amount of blood in an adult human is going to vary between males and females. It's between 5 to 6 liters in males and only between 4 and 5 liters in females. And these differences are due in part to differences in average body size, but also due to the production of a hormone in males known as testosterone, which has a variety of effects. Um, we could list them here. It's probably a good idea to do that. Uh, let's go ahead and pick a color. And we'll go here with red since we're talking about blood. And so if we, if we chalk these effects up to testosterone, testosterone, which remember uh, is made testosterone is made by the testes and the adrenal cortex in males. we have a variety of effects. Okay, Effects of testosterone include an increase in bone density. An increase in hematocrit. An increase in muscle mass. And here we're primarily talking about skeletal muscle. An increase in basal metabolic rate, which is the speed at which you burn your stored fat. And you're also going to see um, with testosterone an increase in male, this is the symbol for male, secondary sex characteristics.
both men and women make testosterone. It's just that we have to appreciate in men that the testosterone levels are generally higher than they are in women. Um, and this is responsible then for a lot of the morphological differences that we see between men and women. Oddly enough, one of the things that happens as we age is that our primary sex hormone levels decline. In men, we have a condition known as low T. In women, uh, after menopause, we have a, a dramatic drop-off in the production of estrogen and progesterone. And the countervailing hormone tends to um, take precedence. In males, we tend to see um, effects of estrogen and progesterone. In females, we tend to see effects of residual um, residual uh, testosterone. So one of the things that we see in men as they age with this condition we now know as low T um, is a drop in hematocrit, a drop in um, bone density, a reduction in lean muscle mass, an increase in body fat. Uh, we also see a reduction in basal metabolic rate, loss of axial and body hair, and often uh, breast growth, so just to name a few. And that's not surprising uh, when you take into account um, the, the resulting hormone, right, testosterone, whose levels drop. Um, in men, by the time they reach, usually around age 50 or so, it's half the levels that it was um, when um, it, we were, were considering, say, in the early mid-20s uh, or even in the teenage years. And in women, um, the drop-off is even more dramatic after menopause, which is when the last egg leaves the ovary, uh, resulting in, again, um, uh, reduction in estrogen and progesterone that leads to, um, if, if it's not treated, early onset osteoporosis, uh, dysregulation of the menstrual and the ovarian cycles, uh, cessation of those cycles, actually, um, and uh, problems with uh, thermoregulation, and uh, electrolyte and water balance, just to name a few. So, uh, something to keep in mind when we get to the endocrine system. Whole blood is the term used when blood has been removed from the body for analysis or storage. Um, its temperature is about body temperature, which is 98.6 Fahrenheit or um, 37 degrees uh, centigrade, more or less. Okay, it's five times more viscous than water. When we say viscosity, what we mean is resistance to flow. So you can think of blood as thicker than water, just as the old saying indicates. And this is due to interactions of dissolved proteins in the plasma and the formed elements that are in the plasma and uh, their association with water molecules. And this tends to um, cause associations that are harder to break when force is applied to the liquid. And so it resists flow more so than just pure water would. Uh, it's slightly alkaline, has a pH between 7.35 and 7.45, averaging around 7.4. Uh, we can separate whole blood by spinning it into a centrifuge, and when we do that, um, generally what we do is we would draw the blood in a tiny uh, glass tube called a capillary tube, and what will happen when we stick your finger and you make a little tiny droplet of blood is that when you touch this hollow tube to the blood, because the glass is made up of um, silicon dioxide, which is a polar compound, the blood, the liquid component of the blood is attracted to it, and this tends to pull it up the tube without a lot of extra added effort. We'll then cap the tube at both ends with clay and spin it in the centrifuge and separate the formed elements from the plasma. The plasma is about 55% of the volume of whole blood, um, and it'll have a range of, of values depending, again, on various conditions, but average 55%. And then the remaining um, cell volume is the other 45%. Okay, This is what we call the hematocrit, or the packed cell volume. And it refers to the percentage of whole blood contributed by the formed elements, 99 percent of which are red blood cells, which we know more commonly as erythrocytes. Let's write that down so that we don't forget it. Okay, Erythrocyte or RBC, basically the same thing. Okay, So we'll indicate here what we're referring to, RBC. 
The prefix erythro, in case you're wondering, means red, and site means cell. So, erythrocyte. The overall average is about 45%. Males average about 47%, females 42%. And the differences, again, as we pointed out earlier, are due to the disparity in androgen production. Those are the hormones that either are or mimic testosterone uh, between males and females. In addition, we have to consider um, the fact that females also lose blood um, as a result of menstruation. So this tends to reduce their hematocrit and as we pointed out earlier they generally have a smaller body size. And So this is just a breakdown of what happens to whole blood when we spin it in a centrifuge. You can see that um, the 55 percent of which is plasma is made up of mostly water and then the remaining six percent, uh, remaining eight percent is broken down into electrolytes and organic compounds and then the plasma proteins, albumins, globulin, fibrinogen, and variety of enzymes and hormones. Now you might ask, okay, well, what are all these for? The albumin has as its primary task to make sure that we maintain blood volume. And it does so by exerting an osmotic effect on the fluid that surrounds the blood vessels, drawing water into the circulation and increasing blood volume and blood pressure. Albumin is made by the liver um, and is put into the blood routinely. When we experience liver failure or when we have a protein poor diet, one of the things that can happen if this goes on for an extended period is a reduction in albumin production resulting in a loss in blood volume and blood pressure. The fluid seeps into the tissues and they become swelled up, what we call adatomous. And so what you'll tend to see is um, enlarged areas of the body. Um, the legs, the arms will swell up um, due to the accumulation of fluid. Uh, the abdomen will swell. It's a condition called ascites. And this is just a problem, again, with the blood generating enough osmotic pressure to pull the fluid from the surrounding tissue into the vessels. The globulins are primarily tasked either with transporting molecules through the plasma or defending against disease depending on the type of globulin we're talking about. Immunoglobulins defend disease. There are other globulin proteins that transport lipid soluble compounds in the blood for instance. Fibrinogen is a precursor to the protein fibrin which is the main component of blood clots and so it exists in a soluble form until an injury event occurs and then a cascade of chemical reactions serves to convert the fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin through primarily enzymatic cleavage. And then enzymes and hormones. Hormones are chemical signals that are carried throughout the body um, in order to elicit a response from a target tissue. And enzymes generate chemical reactions. They facilitate them so that they occur with a much greater speed. One of the main enzymes um, that uh, you'll find in um, blood is an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, okay, which uh, converts carbon dioxide and water into bicarbonate. It's highly concentrated inside RBCs. Um, you also find some of it in plasma as well. There are other hormones um, that we should note, or other enzymes we should note, kinases, which facilitate the clotting cascade, um, and other hormones as well. There are enzymes, rather. Okay, um, other solutes. Electrolytes are important. These are charged particles. Uh, examples of electrolytes you might find in blood include things like sodium and potassium, calcium, um, just to name a few. You'll also find chloride, magnesium, uh, bicarbonate. Okay, organic nutrients would be things like amino acids and um, carbohydrates and also to some extent um, you're going to find uh, fatty acids primarily in the context of the lipoproteins in the blood those being uh, things like chylomicrons and low and high density lipoproteins and so on and we'll get to that 
when we talk about digestion a little bit later on in the course. And organic waste products are primarily carbon dioxide and organic acids that are the result of metabolism, which is essentially the oxidation of molecules like carbohydrates and amino acids and fatty acids with the idea that we can extract energy from them to make ATP and then get rid of the byproducts. And so, um, again, you could think of the blood in, in, this, in this sense as a garbage removal service for the body as well as a pizza delivery service, right? It drops off goodies for fuel and it also removes garbage that we don't want to accumulate around the cells or else they'd get sick and die, okay? In addition to that, also keep in mind that um, there's a considerable amount of gases transported in the blood. Nitrogen, which is biologically inert, um, but uh, carbon dioxide, which is produced as a result of uh, metabolism, is carried in the plasma as bicarbonate. There's a small degree of dissolved oxygen in the plasma. Most of the oxygen carried in blood, as we're going to find out in a minute, is carried in the erythrocytes. Okay, And then if we look at the other 45%, of whole blood after we spin it. The formed elements are made up of the platelets which facilitate blood clotting, the white blood cells which defend against disease, and these can be broken up into what we call granulocytes which have visibly staining granules in their cytoplasm, and agranulocytes which, which lack visibly staining granules, and then finally the red blood cells or erythrocytes whose basic job is to carry oxygen around the body and to a lesser extent carbon dioxide um, they also aid in the maintenance of the body's pH. So the composition of plasma resembles interstitial fluid. It exists um, because of continuous exchange of water, ions, and small molecules across the capillary walls, which are very, very thin. Okay, Just a simple layer of endothelial cells and a tiny bit of um, connective tissue matrix, which are basically the components of the capillaries. 92% of it is water, 7% plasma proteins, 1% other solutes. The primary differences between the plasma and the interstitial fluid are the levels of respiratory gases. Um, you're going to find carbon dioxide um, much higher in the interstitial fluid uh, and oxygen much lower because oxygen is being consumed and carbon dioxide is being generated. It's going to be flipped when you're looking at the blood that's coming to the tissues um, via the arteries and the capillaries. The concentrations of dissolved proteins are also different between interstitial fluid and the plasma, particularly the large proteins, which cannot cross the capillary walls. They tend to be locked into the plasma. And again, as we pointed out, that's what's responsible primarily for maintaining the uh, blood pressure and the blood volume. Plasma proteins tend to stay in solution rather than as insoluble uh, fibers like in other connective tissue. Each has about 100 milliliters. Each 100 milliliters of plasma has about 7.6 grams of protein. The albumins are 60% of the plasma proteins, major contributors to the maintenance of osmotic pressure, while the globulins make up another 35% of the plasma proteins, and they include antibodies that attack and destroy pathogens or facilitate their destruction, we should say. Uh, transport globulins that bind ions, hormones, and other compounds, and large-sized globular um, shape of these proteins, again, prevents them from easily leaving the blood. So we like once these guys are made to kind of keep them in the plasma, don't want them to be leaching out into the interstitium. Fibrinogen is another 4% of all plasma protein. It's important in clotting. Um, these molecules interact to form insoluble fibrin via a, uh, a clotting cascade that's initiated by damage to uh, the blood vessel and surrounding tissue. Uh, the plasma also contains active and inactive enzymes and hormones. Remember that hormones are the chemical signals that uh, coordinate homeostasis, and the enzymes, of course, are responsible for a variety of um, chemical reactions that take place in plasma. Electrolytes are vital for cellular activity. Major ions include sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, uh, phosphate, and sulfate. Also a lot of organic nutrients in the plasma, which are used 
by the cell for ATP production, growth, and maintenance. These include, as we stated earlier, lipids, carbs, and amino acids. And there's also a significant amount of organic waste, which is carried to sites of breakdown or excretion. Um, where are these sites? Uh, the liver does a lot of this. The spleen does a lot of this. Um, uh, excretion uh, is one of the major purviews of the kidney, the excretory system that cleans the blood of nitrogenous waste um, and regulates our electrolyte balance and our pH and our blood pressure and blood volume. Um, also, uh, other sites of excretion occur, uh, of course, in the digestive system uh, through cutaneous transpiration uh, and through sweat uh, and, of course, via the respiratory system. Okay, all, all points where we can excrete uh, waste products. Examples of these waste products include urea, uric acid, creatine, bilirubin, and ammonium. Most of these, as you'll see, are nitrogen-containing compounds, and the reason that we worry about nitrogen-containing compounds to a significant extent is because they tend to be organic bases, and the presence of a base in a solution tends to elevate the pH, and if the pH of the interstitial fluid or the blood plasma gets too high, um, what would happen is denaturation of proteins, a cessation of chemical reactions triggered by enzymes, uh, a loss of structural protein integrity, um, and in addition, a perturbation of membrane potential. All of these could chalk up to death for the cell. And if the cells die, the tissues die. If the tissues die, the organs die. And if the organs die, the organ system shut down. And then that's the end of you. Okay. The formed elements uh, made up of the platelets, which account for less than 0.1% of the total formed elements. These are small membrane-bound cell fragments that aid in clotting. The white cells known as leukocytes, which account for 0.1% of the formed elements, and they participate in defense against pathogens. There are five classes, each with a slightly different function. We'll delve into those a little bit more later. And then the red cells known as erythrocytes that account for over 99% of the formed elements, and they're essential primarily for oxygen transport in blood, and to a lesser extent, carbon dioxide transport and the maintenance of blood pH. Okay, so where do these formed elements come from? And the answer is bone marrow. Okay, um, And where is red bone marrow? Well, these are sites of hematopoiesis. Primarily, we're talking here about the flat bones of the body, uh, the, the bones of the cranium, uh, the ribs, uh, the bones of the pelvic girdle, okay? Um, in addition, uh, we find hematopoietic tissue in the heads of the femur uh, and the humerus. And um, hematopoiesis, of course, is critical because one of the things we note about the formed elements, especially the thrombocytes and the erythrocytes, is that they do not have a nucleus and they have limited biosynthetic capability. So after about two and a half trips through the circulatory system, they're ruined and they have to be recycled and replaced. And so this is why uh, we need hematopoiesis to go on almost every day. Okay? All formed elements uh, form from hematopoietic stem cells known as hemocytoblasts. These are self-renewing multipotent stem cells that can produce more than one cell type. Uh, they are more limited than pluripotent stem cells, which have a variety of fates available to them. Uh, these have a, a, a smaller number of possible fates. Um, they divide to produce two primary types of stem cells, um, the myeloid and the lymphoid stem cells. Um, and we'll talk about what comes from each of these lineages. But before we do that, we should kind of talk a little bit about stem cells in general. And we should point out the fact that what defines a cell as a stem cell is the ability of that cell to use the information in the nucleus to, to engage in any number of potential fates, meaning um, to become any potential type of adult uh, cell, be it a, a, a skin cell, a muscle cell, a nerve cell, a, uh, a red blood cell, and so on. Okay? We call those totipotent stem cells, and there's really only two sources. Um, cord blood, which is found um, 
in, in the placenta and in the umbilicus and in, of course, the, uh, the, the blastocyst and the morula. Okay? What happens as we develop from this initial state of fertilization um, to the final product, which is, of course, a neonate in this case, is that the information in the nucleus becomes more and more restricted over time and that causes the cell to lose the ability to adapt certain cell fates. Eventually it gets steered down one avenue and becomes one type of tissue and at that point it carries out its job in the organism. An important thing to understand however about stem cells is that when they divide um, they sort of break the rule of mitosis that states that after a cell gets to a certain size and divides, the two cells that are produced look and act exactly like the original. In a stem cell, um, we break this rule, and when the cell divides, one cell will remain behind as a stem cell, and the other cell will differentiate and become the adult cell. So if we imagine that this is the stem cell in the human body, and then we divide, one cell will grow up, uh, and the other product of that cell division will stay behind and remain a stem cell. So we'll call this a stem cell SC, okay? And this is a differentiated cell, okay? DC, okay? And we think that part of the reason this happens is because of the contact that the stem cell has with certain signals in the extracellular environment that tell one member of the cell division to remain as a stem cell and the other member of the cell division um, to differentiate and become the adult tissue. Okay, So very important that we understand that in the human body the stem cell populations are critical for regenerating new tissue as old tissue becomes damaged and has to be replaced. We lose those stem cell populations, we lose that regenerative capacity and the result then is we very rapidly lose function in that organ or that tissue. So there's two types of stem cells that are produced by hemocytoblasts, the lymphoid stem cells that are responsible for production of lymphocytes. Some of these remain in their original location in the red marrow, and others migrate to lymphoid tissue, such as the thymus, the spleen, and the lymph nodes. The myeloid stem cells divide to give rise to all types of formed elements other than the lymphocytes. So uh, this would include the platelets, the red blood cells, um, and so on. Okay, uh, The granulocytes would also be the purview of the myeloid lines. So let's kind of look a little bit deeper into these different cell types. The lymphoid stem cells become lymphocytes. They differentiate into lymphoblasts which then become prolymphocytes. The prolymphocytes then become lymphocytes and then they're capable of defending against disease. The chemical signals that allow this to happen are called colony stimulating factors. These are hormones released by activated lymphocytes and other cells during an immune response that stimulate the formation of these cells. Okay, so when we're under attack, we need more of these, and so we produce more of these um, through the process of cell division and cell differentiation. Now, um, there's two different types of lymphocytes and when we get to the immune system we'll learn a little bit more about these but we should touch on them just briefly for a moment these are the B lymphocytes which are responsible for antibody production and the T lymphocytes which are responsible for regulating the immune response and also directly attacking pathogens or infected tissue so let's write that down we've got the B lymphocytes B lymph Okay, and the T lymphocytes. Okay, there's only one type of B lymphocyte in terms of function, and these are the antibody producers. So it's right in makes antibodies. The T lymphocytes can be divided into the helper T's. We'll write help. The cytotoxic T's. We'll write cyto toxic 
and then finally down here the regulatory T's. Okay. Now what do each of these do? Well the helper T's basically stimulate the immune response when we're under attack so that we produce an army of cytotoxic T and B cells that are designed to attack that particular pathogen and destroy it. Okay. The cytotoxic T's actually have to show up where the pathogen's located or at the site of the infected tissue in order to destroy it using a variety of chemical attacks. And then the regulatory T cells turn off the response once we've conquered the invader. So we'll get more in detail on those uh, when we get to the immune system. The myeloid stem cells um, become uh, immature blast cells. Um, they differentiate into three types of progenitors which differentiate into monoblasts and myeloblasts. These differentiate into megakaryocytes, which are large cells um, that break off portions of their cytoplasm, and this is what produces now the thrombocytes, those cells that are responsible for mediating the blood clotting um, response. Okay, So um, it's the platelets in the blood that, when they encounter damaged tissue, um, basically pop open and release the clotting factors that um, start the production eventually of a fibrin clot that prevents hemorrhaging. The megakaryocyte here, okay, is what produces uh, the platelets. The proerythroblasts down here will eventually become erythrocytes, red blood cells, and the myeloblasts and monoblasts will eventually form um, the granulocytes, okay, when in the case of the myeloblasts, and the monoblasts will eventually form monocytes, which will eventually form macrophages. And so we'll get into those in just a minute here. Okay, um, if we look at the proerythroblasts, okay, the proerythroblasts are again uh, derived from the myeloid stem line. They become erythroblasts. The proerythroblasts. Um, go through the erythroblast stage and then become reticulocytes which will eventually become red blood cells. These will be enucleate um, cells with a large quantity of hemoglobin and carbonic anhydrase inside and their job primarily is to carry oxygen around the body. Um, if we look up here at the myeloblasts we see that they form myelocytes which will generate these band cells and these band cells essentially are the different granulocytes right we've got the erythrocytes the basophils and the neutrophils here um, these, these that are derived from these band cells and they each have a slightly different role in the immune system um, the, the, the basophils are filled with uh, blue staining granules that contain histamine they mediate the inflammatory response. The, uh, the um, eosinophils, these guys here, have red granules. They're responsible for defending against parasitic attacks and also are important in the mediation of the allergic reaction. And then the neutrophils are primarily there to attack and destroy bacterial infection. The pro-monocytes will become monocytes, which will eventually become um, mon uh, become um, macrophages and the macrophage job is to eat dead or infected material um, or pathogens and then display fragments of those infected cells or those pathogens to warn the immune system that there is um, an agent in the body that's trying to cause disease, a pathogen of some type and it's through the interaction of the macrophages with the lymphocytes that we select those particular B and T lymphocytes that are going to best defend us against this particular pathogenic attack. Okay, okay uh, one of the ways we control the production of the formed elements is through a hormone called erythropoietin which is produced by the kidneys um, in response to low oxygen levels, a condition known as hypoxia. The erythropoietin stimulates stem cells and developing RBCs in the red marrow. Um, conditions that stimulate its release include anemia, a drop in blood flow to the kidneys, drop in oxygen content in the lungs, 
that can result from disease or high altitudes and damage to the respiratory surface of the lungs. All of these result in a low oxygen condition. We solve the low oxygen condition by increasing the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood by jacking up the erythrocyte content. Okay, promonocytes become monocytes. Um, the three types of band cells that form, again, from the myeloid line um, give rise to the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils, as we stated earlier. You can see those here. The megakaryocytes will shed their cytoplasmic packets, forming the platelets, and the reticulocytes will di differentiate eventually into the erythrocytes. Okay, And so what you're looking at here is, is the entire scheme. You can see, if we look in the red marrow, that you've got lots of venous sinuses. The red marrow is all around these uh, venous sinuses, and the hematopoietic stem cells reside in the red marrow, generating the lymphoid stem cells and the myeloid cells. The lymphoid cells <coughs> producing, of course, the lymphocytes, um, the B and the T lymphocytes, and the myeloid lineage producing everything else. Okay, so you can see how the progenitors stimulated by CSFs um, will form um, either myeloblasts or monoblasts. The myeloblasts will eventually generate the granulocytes. The monoblasts will eventually generate monocytes, which will become macrophages. They can also become megakaryocytes under the proper set of conditions, which will shed platelets. And they can also, under the proper um, influence of erythropoietin, form reticulocytes, which will generate the oxygen-carrying erythrocytes. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this whole process is that once we pass a certain developmental stage, we can't go back and adopt another fate. And the reason for that is that the information that's utilized to do that has been chemically sealed off in the nucleus of the cell, so it's no longer available to direct cellular activity. It's still present, but it's kind of like having a book in the library that exists in a locked room or a book that has all its pages pasted together. The information is still in the book, but you can't read it anymore. And this is on purpose. This is to direct cells down a certain fate um, in order for them to fulfill their, their destiny in the human body. Okay? Okay. Next thing we want to do is delve into a little more detail in terms of the structured function of the different formed elements. So we'll define hematology and describe the elements of a complete blood count and give examples of red blood cell lab tests. We'll list the characteristics and functions of RBCs and describe the structure and function of hemoglobin. We'll describe how the components of aged or damaged red cells are recycled and we'll explain the importance of blood typing and the basis of the ABO and RH incompatibilities. We'll get into a clinical module where we'll talk about hemolytic disease of the newborn and explain the clinical significance of cross-reacting um, between fetal and maternal blood types and site preventative measures. We'll categorize the various types of white cells and the basis of their structure and function. We'll talk about the mechanisms that control blood loss after an injury. This is a phenomenon known as hemostasis. And describe the reaction sequence for, the blood, for blood clotting, how it takes place. And we'll delve into a clinical module that will describe how blood disorders are detected and examples of different categories of blood disorders. So hematology, very simply, is the study of blood. It's the tissues that form blood and blood disorders, which we call dyscrasias. It provides an important set of information about the person's health. It can detect disorders like anemia, infection, and problems with clotting. Um, we call these conditions hemophilias. The reasons for performing blood tests is to determine the blood type and to evaluate your red and your white count and your platelet count. Abnormal values ind indicate usually a problem, some underlying disease condition that results in either having too many or too few or improper versions of each of these cell types. A CBC determines the red count, the white count, and the erythrocyte indices. This would be essentially a measurement of the hemoglobin content of the blood. 
um, also determines the hematocrit, which is the volume of whole blood made up by the packed red cells, and the platelet count in one cubic millimeter of blood, okay, which would work out to a microliter. For those of you wondering uh, how much is a microliter, a microliter is one times ten to the minus sixth meters. Okay, so let's write that down so that we know what we're talking about. Whenever you see this funny looking symbol here, that means micro, okay, and micro translates to one times ten to the minus sixth of whatever we're talking about, okay? Micro. We can also do a differential count to identify the types and the numbers of each white blood cell, okay? And so these are some typical values for a CBC. Hematocrit, around 42%. Hemoglobin, around 15 grams per deciliter. Um, the MCH, around 30 micrograms per uh, red blood cell, that's basically the hemoglobin measurement. Uh, the mean cell volume, about 90 cubic micrometers per cell. The platelet count, about 350,000 per microliter. RBC count, about 5.2 million per microliter. White count, about 7,000 per microliter. And then you can see here the differential. Okay, now the interesting thing about the differential is there's a mnemonic that you can use in order to remember these differentials. Okay, notice that the neutrophils are the most numerous, followed by the uh, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. So what's a, a good way to remember uh, the order in which these appear in normal blood? And it's to use the mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas. Okay, so let's write that down. Never let monkeys eat bananas. And that goes for neutrophil, lymphocyte, monocyte, eosinophil, basophil. Okay? And that's so that's referring to again a normal abundance of the white cells. Okay, if we have a, a condition in which some of these are reduced or flip-flopped, then we have a disease state of some type. Red cell tests include several common tests that check the number, the size, and the shape and maturity of the circulating erythrocytes. They can detect some problems that may not produce obvious signs or symptoms, such as internal bleeding. So you're looking here at a stained blood cell. The big purple discs are the erythrocytes, and then the little things that look like little specks of purple dirt uh, you can see some here and here. Those are platelets, okay? Red cells are roughly a third of all the cells in the human body. A single drop of blood contains about 260 million red cells. Average adult has about 25 trillion total. The red count is a standard blood test, red cell count. It reports the number of red blood cells per microliter or cubic millimeter of blood. Those are two interchangeable um, measurements of volume. Adult males have between 4.5 to 6.3 million red blood cells per microliter and the adult females between 4.2 and 5.5 million. Okay, And again, this is due to differences primarily in testosterone levels as well as, as we noted earlier, the fact that women menstruate, men do not, and the fact that women are smaller and men tend to be larger on average. This is a look, close-up look at a red blood cell. It is basically shaped like a frisbee. It's a biconcave disc. It has a thin central region and a thick rim. Average diameter is about 8 micrometers. It does not have a nucleus, so we say it's anucleate. And it lacks most other organelles, including ribosomes. It can't divide or repair itself, and that's why it can only make about two and a half trips through circulatory system before it has to be recycled. It has a lifespan of less than 120 days. Okay, so if you figure there's 30 days in a month, you're talking about four months on average. Now, you might say, well, why does it look so strange? Why is it such a weird looking cell? And it's to increase the amount of diffusion and transport that goes on 
across the cell membrane. This um, cell surface is uh, essentially um, an effective way to get a lot of oxygen into and out of the RBC depending on where it is in the circulatory system um, as well as um, allow it to uh, transport uh, electrolytes, water, um, hydrogen ions, bicarbonate and so on. Okay, And so we have to increase the amount of surface area and we do that by having this funny looking external shape we also increase the amount of area available for these tasks by removing the organelles and filling it basically with hemoglobin, carbonic anhydrase, and then a protein that's on the cytoplasmic side of the membrane called spectrin, which kind of holds the thing together as it passes through on its route through the circulatory system. They have a large surface area to volume ratio, which allows for greater uh, chance for oxygen exchange. The total surface area of all red blood cells in the, in the blood is about 3.8 square kilometers. Okay? It can form stacks, which we call rouleaux, that facilitate transport through small vessels like capillaries. You can see some rouleaux up here in this diagram. And they're very flexible. They can bend. This allows movement through capillaries with diameters less than the red blood cell diameter and these can be as narrow as four micrometers and you might think okay well that's kinda cool but on the other side of this problem is the fact that when these red blood cells are squeezing through these narrow vessels and rubbing against the sides of the capillaries they're damaging themselves and so um, after about four months of doing this um, the damage to them is so great that they have to be recycled and replaced. And the place that this happens primarily is the spleen and the liver. Okay, Their job is to get rid of the old RBCs and to produce now fresh RBCs, um, well to allow the fresh RBCs made by the red marrow to take the place of the damaged ones. Okay, okay. Next thing we want to do is take a little bit deeper look at the structure of red blood cells. These are the erythrocytes. And what we find if we open a red blood cell up primarily is hemoglobin, which is a pigment designed specifically to transport oxygen in the body. It also binds to carbon dioxide to a lesser extent, and as we'll see in a bit, um, this is actually a very important aspect of the gas transport properties of hemoglobin because what we'll find out is that as oxygen competes for its binding sites on the hemoglobin molecule, it tends to force the bound carbon dioxide out of hemoglobin and vice versa. As carbon dioxide competes for its sites on hemoglobin, it tends to force out the oxygen that the hemoglobin is bound to. And this is an allosteric interaction, um, but it plays a very important role in allowing hemoglobin to dump off its oxygen when it arrives at metabolically active tissue and to pick up oxygen when it's in the uh, the lung tissue. So its major function is the transport of respiratory gases. Um, hemoglobin is the major molecule. It's 95 percent of the intracellular protein in erythrocytes uh, and its content is reported in grams of hemoglobin per deciliter of whole blood. The adult male range is between 14 to 18 grams per deciliter, while females slightly less at between 12 to 16. Now if we examine the hemoglobin structure, we find that it has quaternary structure, meaning that there are separate polypeptide chains that make up the structure of the overall molecule, two alpha chains and two beta chains. And they're each complexed with a heme molecule, which is an unusual looking porphyrin derivative that has a structure somewhat like a spider's web comprised primarily of carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen. And in the center of this heme is a molecule of iron. And this is where the oxygen actually attaches in the hemoglobin molecule. So you can see the heme molecules situated here, 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 and here. So there's four heme molecules per hemoglobin molecule. So each heme contains an iron that interacts with oxygen forming oxyhemoglobin which gives blood its bright red color. One of the things that you'll find out um, if, you, if you study chemistry and biochemistry um, 
for any extended period of time is that brightly colored solutions have uh, one or the other or both characteristics. They either contain metal ions, which causes many of them to be brightly colored, particularly transition metal ions, or um, they contain organic molecules with conjugated double bonds, and that also gives them um, very bright colors. So the binding of the iron to the oxygen is a reversible process. Hemoglobin not bound to oxygen is called deoxyhemoglobin, and it gives the oxygenated blood a dark red color, which looks blue when you observe it through the walls of veins in the systemic circulation and through the walls of arteries in the pulmonary circulation. Each red blood cell has about 280 million hemoglobin molecules which contain four heme units, so each red blood cell can carry more than a billion oxygen molecules. Over 98% of the oxygen carried by the blood is bound to hemoglobin. The rest, which is a very small amount, is dissolved in plasma. Now, what, what do we see when we look at the lifespan of a red blood cell? Where does it come from? What does it do? And then where does it go once it's outlived its usefulness? About 1% of circulating red cells are replaced daily with about 3 million new erythrocytes entering the circulation per second. Rapid replacement is necessary because these red cells only last four months. Red, red cells are generally engulfed by macrophages in the spleen once they reach the end of their useful life. They're also recycled in the liver or bone marrow, uh, again, once they're no longer functional cells. Blood cell formation occurs only in the red marrow uh, as a result of the process of erythropoiesis that takes place in the myeloid tissue. And again, to reiterate, this red marrow is found in the flat bones of the skeletal system, uh, the, also in the vertebrae, and um, in the proximal limb bones. Okay, So um, if you've ever seen an advertisement for um, a bone marrow donation, one of the things that they'll do is... Um, they'll give you a, a topical anesthetic and then they'll take a needle that has a very wide bore and they'll insert it through your hip into the crest of the ilium to withdraw some of this red marrow um, for a study. Now they'll pay you quite a bit of money for this um, between five hundred to thousand dollars but um, honestly many people think it's not really worth the, uh, the, the cost because it's extremely painful. They're essentially giving you uh, the equivalent of a hip pointer. Fatty marrow can replace the red marrow in long bones as we age um, and vice versa. Um, we can convert fatty marrow into red marrow if we have severe sustained hemorrhaging. Um, in the beginning, when the skeletal system is first formed, in the neonate, we have red marrow in virtually every bone in the body, but over time, what happens is that the yellow marrow begins to predominate in the long bones of the appendicular skeleton and is only retained as red marrow in the heads of things like the, the, uh, the humerus and the femur. Um, by the process of converting this yellow marrow into red marrow, we increase the rate of erythropoiesis and we fill the void produced by um, the event that resulted in the hemorrhaging or the blood loss, whatever it may be. Okay, developing red cells absorb amino acids and iron from the blood and they synthesize hemoglobin. Red cells go through the following developmental stages. We go from myeloid stem cells to proerythroblasts to basophilic erythroblasts, which synthesize hemoglobin, to normoblasts, which eject their nucleus and cellular organelles and transform into a reticulocyte, um, which will contain about 80% of the hemoglobin of a mature red cell, enters the bloodstream after about two days, and after 24 hours is converted into a mature red cell. And you can see the entire process here. Okay, the developing red cells absorb their um, building blocks from the bloodstream 
and then they synthesize the new hemoglobin molecules and we can see the progression here over the succeeding four days um, from proerythroblast to reticulocyte and then ultimately to erythrocyte. So this is just a quick video that will give you an overview of how hemoglobin is produced and recycled in the body. So take a listen. When old red blood cells rupture, the released hemoglobin is ingested by macrophages. The globin chains of hemoglobin are broken down to individual amino acids that are metabolized or used to build new proteins. Iron is released from the heme of hemoglobin. The remaining structure is converted to biliverdin, which is then converted into bilirubin. Iron is transported by transferrin in the blood to various tissues for storage or to red bone marrow for making new hemoglobin. Free bilirubin is transported by albumin in the blood to the liver. Liver cells make conjugated bilirubin, which is excreted as part of the bile into the small intestine. Intestinal bacteria convert bilirubin into bilirubin derivatives, which contribute to the color of feces. Some of the bilirubin derivatives are absorbed into the blood and excreted from the kidneys in the urine. Okay, another very important um, aspect of the circulatory system that we have to touch on is this idea of blood types. Now, all blood is functionally the same in that it carries gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and so forth. Um, it carries nutrients and waste products. It carries electrolytes and hormones and enzymes. Um, and it contains um, also a considerable amount of proteins, albumin, the globulins, and so on. So all blood is functionally identical. But if we look a little bit more detail at the formed elements of blood, um, what we find are differences at the molecular level that are important to distinguish uh, one person's blood from the other. And one of the ways that we distinguish um, differences between these different um, molecules on the surfaces of red blood cells is to um, engage in what we call blood typing. And what blood typing examines are the presence of specific sugars or other molecules on the surfaces of red blood cells that distinguish them antigenically from functionally identical but 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 molecularly different um, antigenically uh, erythrocytes. Okay, so you could think of these blood mo these molecules that we use for blood typing as a um, a method of identifying the cells as belonging to that individual, okay, as tagging the cell um, for um, either destruction or for um, for recognition of by the immune system as to whether or not it belongs in your body or not, okay. So these blood types are determined by the presence or the absence of cell surface markers that we call antigens. These are genetically determined membrane glycoproteins or glycolipids and they can trigger a protective defense mechanism um, if we have a mismatch between um, the blood that's coming in and the individual's immune system. This immune response can result in the destruction of the incoming red blood cells. They're meant to identify the blood cells as self or foreign to the immune system. If they're identified as self red blood cells, then the immune system will not target these cells for destruction. If they're identified as foreign, then the immune system will um, engage in a series of processes designed to destroy these erythrocytes. There are more than 50 blood cell surface antigens that exist, but three are critically important in the process of blood typing, and these are A, B, or the RH antigen, sometimes known as D. So this is a look at um, how these antigens work. Um, so take a listen to uh, this quick discussion of cytotoxic hypersensitivity. 
Type 2 hypersensitivities involve interactions of antibodies and surface antigens of cells, followed by complement-assisted lysis of these cells. A typical example is mismatched blood transfusions. There are four different blood groups based on types of antigens on the surfaces of the red blood cells. People who are type A have A antigens, and those who are type B have B antigens on the surfaces of their red blood cells. Persons who are type AB have both A and B antigens, and those who are type O have neither A nor B antigens. The serum of people with type A blood contains antibodies against type B antigens, and the serum of people with type B blood contains antibodies against type A antigens. Type AB serum contains neither antibody, and O serum contains antibodies against both A and B antigens. If blood from a person who is type B is transfused into a person who is type A, antibodies present in the type A blood react with the surface antigens on the incoming red blood cells. This leads to complement fixation and lysis of these cells. If blood from a person who is type A is transfused into a person who is type B, Antibodies present in the type B blood react with the surface antigens on the incoming red blood cells. This also leads to complement fixation and cell lysis. Persons who are type O lack A and B antigens on the surfaces of their red blood cells and are therefore universal donors. Persons with type AB blood lack antibodies against A or B antigens and are therefore universal recipients. Okay, now with regard to the RH surface antigens, the term RH comes from the discovery of these particular cell surface identification molecules in rhesus monkeys. Okay, so that's where we get the RH abbreviation from. An individual who's RH positive has the D surface antigen on the surface of their erythrocytes, while an RH negative individual would lack that surface antigen. So we indicate that those individuals either have blood type plus or minus with regard to the RH antigens. So some examples of some different blood types include um, things like O negative or A positive. Now, What's important to understand here about these letter designations and these plus or minus designations is that the, the letter designation and the plus or minus designation have nothing to do with each other, okay? Um, they have a, as little to do with each other as your first and your last name, okay? So when we say, for instance, that an individual is O negative, okay, let's take this individual here, what we're saying is that they possess the O antigen and they lack the RH antigen. Okay? In this individual, A positive, okay, over here, this, this one that I, I'm circling now, pointing to with the arrow, an A-positive individual would have the A antigen and would also have the RH antigen. Okay? If an individual were A-negative, okay, they would have the A antigen and lack the RH antigen. So this is a little chart showing you how it is we go about typing an individual's blood so that we can give them a, a transfusion that won't be rejected by the immune system. Drops of the patient's blood are mixed with solutions that contain antibodies to the surface antigens A, B, and D. Remember that D is the RH antigen. Clumping occurs when the sample containing the corresponding antigen 
um, reacts with the antibody and forms a cluster of red blood cells surrounded by plasma. Okay? As an example, type A blood will clump with the anti-A antibody um, and will fail to clump with the anti-B antibody. Type B blood will clump with the anti-B antibody and not with the anti-A, and type O blood won't clump with either antibody. And what do you mean by clumping? Well, let me show you um, what clumping looks like. So um, here we have an individual who is B positive, which means they have the B antigen and they also have the RH antigen. So we look here with the anti-A antibody, we don't see any clumping because the anti-A antibody is only going to react with the A antigen. However, with the anti-B antibody, we see clumping. Notice the little red blotches in the middle of the serum. And also, we see clumping with the RH antibody. Okay, um, Down here, O negative, okay, will not clump with either the anti-A or anti-B antibody or the RH antibody because they lack all three of those antigens. AB positive has all three antigens, it has the A antigen, the B antigen, and the RH antigen, and as a result, they clump in all three tests. Okay? The point of this is to determine an individual's blood type so that we can give them the proper blood so the immune system won't hemolyze and destroy the incoming donor cells. As an example, okay, if we had somebody with A positive blood, an individual with A positive blood would contain antibodies against the B antigen, but would not contain antibodies against any other antigen. So they would be able to receive blood from an A positive individual, an O positive individual, or an O negative individual. An individual with A negative blood would be able to receive blood from an A negative individual or an O negative individual. Um, they could receive a first transfusion from an A positive or an O positive individual, but a second transfusion with that same blood type might end up killing the individual, okay? because they would have developed antibodies against the RH antigen, which they lack if the individual is RH negative. Okay? So they naturally would generate antibodies upon exposure to the RH antigen for the first time in their lives. So that's something we have to be aware of. So, the thing to notice about these different blood types, okay, you can, wh what are the possible blood types? Well, um, you can be A positive or A negative, you can be B positive or B negative, you can be AB positive or AB negative, and you can be O positive or O negative. Those are all the different eight blood types that are possible when considering these two different systems. And the, the blood that you can receive is determined by the compatibility of the donor antigens with the recipient's antibodies. So if we were to take, for instance, um, the B positive individual, okay, we have to ask the question, okay, what antibodies does the B positive individual have? Well, they would only have antibodies against antigens that they themselves don't possess. So there would be anti-A antibodies in this individual's plasma. So they could not receive any blood that had the type A antigen on it. So that would include A positive and negative, AB positive and negative. They could receive the other blood types. And here you can see B positive, O positive, or negative. Okay. Um, these individuals could also receive um, B negative blood. We should point that out as well. Okay. Um, in the case of an AB individual, they're not going to have antibodies against either A or B, or in this case, this AB positive individual, they're not going to have antibodies against the RH antigen either. So they're what we're called a universal recipient. They can receive any blood type regardless um, because they won't generate now a hypersensitivity reaction to the incoming red blood cells. An O negative individual is what's termed a universal donor. And the reason they're termed a universal donor is because the O antigen does not have a corresponding antibody and since they lack the RH antigen they don't have to worry about um, whether the blood's being donated to somebody who is RH positive or negative. It doesn't make any difference. 
So in an O negative individual, we can give their blood to anybody and not worry about a, a, a reaction between the donor red blood cells and the recipient antibodies. Now you might well ask, and, and I hope you have, well, why don't we have to worry about the antibodies of the donor's blood? And the reason for that is that when we collect whole blood, we very rarely, if ever, give that as a transfusion. With donor blood, what we do is we centrifuge out the formed elements, we remove the plasma which contains the antibody component, and then we resuspend it in physiological saline. And so the antibody titer is almost non-existent in donor packed cells. And that's why you don't have to worry about the donor's antibodies because they're generally processed out when individuals donate blood, when they give blood. Okay? So what I want you guys to do is to study this chart and understand it and be able to tell me, um, depending on blood type, which blood types that individual can receive and to which blood types those individuals can donate and why. Okay? Very important that um, you, you grasp this concept. Okay? So the presence of anti-A or anti-B antibodies is determined by genetics and remains constant throughout life. There, there's no need to be exposed to foreign red blood cells to develop those antibodies. They're already present in the plasma. In an individual who's Rh negative, the only time they're going to generate Rh antibodies is if they're exposed to the Rh antigen. And so an individual who's Rh negative hopefully will go their entire life without ever being exposed um, to the Rh antigen and as a result won't generate um, antibodies against that particular antigen. But in the case that they are exposed at some point, either due to a mismatched transfusion or in the case of a Rh negative mother who's present with, pregnant with an Rh positive child, what will happen upon that initial exposure is that they'll generate anti-RH antibodies from that point forward and then a second exposure will result in the destruction of those red blood cells and basically render them useless. So let's talk a little bit about hemolytic disease of the newborn also known as erythroblastosis fetalis. Blood type is determined by the genes that come from both parents. Because of different possibilities of combinations a child can have a different blood type than the parent can have. If the blood type of the fetus is different than the blood type of the mother, we can have potential issues. Anti-A and anti-B antibodies are too large to cross the placenta, and so they don't represent a danger. But the Rh antibody is small enough that it can cross the placenta and hemolyze the infant's blood. And that's why we call it erythroblastosis fetalis, literally uh, or hemolytic disease of the newborn, we're rupturing the newborn's red blood cells. The result is a destruction of the RBCs, and worse than that, the release of hemoglobin into the plasma, which is very, very detrimental um, as it can cause the clogging of capillary beds, it can cause uh, choking of blood off from downstream um, organs or tissues, uh, resulting in massive infarct and death. Um, it's just not a good situation. The only place hemoglobin belongs in the human body is inside an RBC or an RBC progenitor. Okay, So in the case of an, an RH negative mother um, who's married to an RH positive husband, um, what happens up at birth is that there's an exposure of that RH negative mother to the baby's blood as the placenta is torn from the uterus and she begins to develop antibody from that point forward against the Rh antigen. Now, this is a problem when if there's a second pregnancy with an Rh positive child because that antibody is small enough to cross the placenta and hemolyze the baby's blood. And so, before the advent of a drug called Rogam, um, you had to have a blood test to check for Rh compatibility between the husband and the wife. And um, based on the results of that blood test, that would inform your decision whether or not to get married or have children because you ran the risk on the second pregnancy of killing the child half the time. In 
the, the scenario of an RH negative woman married to an RH positive man. Okay, so this condition is caused when maternal antibodies cross the placenta and attack the fetal red cells. It has a lot of forms and different uh, presents with different severity. Most common involves the mother being RH negative and the fetus being RH positive. In the first pregnancy, there's no issue. The fetal cells um, that enter the maternal blood circulation are um, going to initiate antibody production after the birth has taken place. The mother's immune system doesn't get stimulated to produce any RH antibodies until that event has happened. At birth, the bleeding at the placenta and the uterus allow the fetal and maternal blood to mix. The mother gets exposed to the antigen and she begins to develop antibodies against that antigen. And this is basically a process known as sensitization. About 20% of RH negative mothers who carry RH positive children are sensitized within six months of delivery. The first infant isn't affected because the antibodies have yet to develop, but the subsequent pregnancy puts the infant in danger. The maternal anti-RH antibodies can cross the placenta if she's been sensitized and get into the fetal blood, destroy the red blood cells causing anemia, anemia in the fetus, and can drop the red count um, of red blood cells from the bone marrow um, prior to the baby's birth. And this is the basis for the name erythroblastosis fetalis. It has a high fatality rate if we do not treat it. The newborn becomes anemic and jaundiced because of high bilirubin concentration in the tissues. Um, remember that bilirubin is a breakdown product of heme. Um, individuals who appear jaundiced tend to have a yellow cast to their skin and to their eyes. The maternal antibodies remain active two months after delivery and may require replacement of the infant's entire blood volume. So we have to do a complete transfusion. Hemolytic disease of the newborn is prevented by giving the mother anti-RH antibodies in a medication known as Rogam given in weeks 26 to 28 of the pregnancy and during and after delivery. And what it does is it hides the antigen from exposure to the immune system. These antibodies destroy fetal red cells that have crossed the placenta um, before they stimulate a maternal immune response and results now in no maternal sensitization. Okay, so basically we, we don't allow the mother's immune system to see the red cells because we nuke them before they ever get a chance to result in an exposure. And so, as a result of this, she can have as many RH positive children as she wants without risk of hemolyzing the newborn's blood. And so it's just a diagram showing you the events of the first and second pregnancy and how they relate to hemolytic disease of the newborn. Okay, so very important that you understand this. Now, another important thing to point out with this, this disease is the fact that the placenta is like a semi-permeable barrier, and it'll let molecules below a certain size cross from the mother's blood into the baby's blood and this can have dramatic effects on the baby's development. In the case of hemolytic disease of the newborn it results in hemolysis and destruction of red cells which can potentially kill the child um, but it also goes for other components that can end up in the blood such as alcohol or recreational or prescription drugs or in the case of certain pathogens that are small enough to cross such as viruses we can end up having those components get into um, the fetal blood and severely affect development, uh, potentially um, e either produce birth defects or in some cases uh, result in a spontaneous abortion, uh, killing the child in some cases. All right? So we tell mothers, especially during the first trimester, when we're building things like the musculoskeletal and the cardiopulmonary system and the nervous system, to stay away from alcohol and recreational drugs and individuals who have contagious diseases because you're putting your baby at severe risk, okay, because all of those things can cross. They all have the potential to be tiny enough to get across the placenta and into the baby's bloodstream. Okay, let's talk a little bit about white cells now. Um, they spend only a short time in circulation. They're mostly found in loose and dense connective tissue where infections occur 
and can migrate in and out of the bloodstream as a result of response to certain chemical cues. They can contact and adhere to the vessel walls near an infection site and squeeze between adjacent endothelial cells through a process called diapedesis, and this allows them then to gain proximity to the area of the infection of the injury. They're attracted to chemical stimuli through positive chemotaxis. This is a very interesting property of cells that allows them to move towards a particular diffusible component in a solution. Um, in the case of these white blood cells, they're attracted to chemicals that are given off during infection or damage, and this allows them to more effectively battle the pathogen or um, affect things like tissue repair or uh, tissue um, tissue recycling, okay, breakdown of dead tissue, useless tissue, and eventually setting the stage for other cells to come in and generate now um, new tissue underneath where the injury or the infection occurred. Okay? This is probably one of the first characteristics that evolved in living cells was the ability to move towards chemicals that would enhance their survival and away from chemicals that would kill them. The idea being that they might be attracted to things like food and they might be repelled um, by things like toxins. And so if you were able to express this characteristic early on in your development, you're more likely to survive and evolve. Whereas <coughs> if you lack this ability, then it's extremely likely that you could end up... Um, dying before you ever got a chance to reproduce. This phenomenon guides white cells to pathogens to damage tissues and other active white cells. Neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes are all capable of phagocytosis as well as diapedesis. Phagocytosis is the process of engulfing the pathogen or the cellular debris with the idea that you'll destroy it Use some of the components to warn the immune system. Use other components as fuel and then pitch the waste products. Macrophages are monocytes that have moved out of the bloodstream and are actively engulfing pathogen and facilitating the immune response by presenting foreign antigens to the lymphocytes that are nearby. Okay, a normal individual has about 7,000 white cells per microliter of blood. The number can be increased in response to infection, inflammation, or allergy. A differential count indicates the number of each type of white cell in the sample, and it's usually reported as a percentage per 100 white cells. There's two white blood cell classes, the granulocytes or the agranulocytes. Okay? Now, the granulocytes are made up of the eosinophils, the neutrophils, and the basophils. And they're called granulocytes because they have cytoplasmic granules that stain using a very a particular dye that contains um, components like basic fusin and eosin. Eosin is the red dye in the stain, and basic fusion is the blue dye in the saint. So neutrophils tend to have pinkish looking granules as we'll see in a minute. Eosinophils reddish granules and basophils blue granules. And they all have slightly different roles. Okay, Neutrophils tend to be the bacteria fighters. Eosinophils fight the parasites and mediate, mediate allergic responses. And basophils promote inflammation by the release of histamine. Okay. The agranular um, agranulocytes or agranular leukocytes are the lymphocytes and the monocytes. Okay? They have cytoplasmic granules but they don't stain and so they're invisible when we look at them under the microscope. Monocytes make up about eh, call it 6% of the leukocytes and the lymphocytes about 30% on average. Now what are the roles of these different cells? Well the granular leukocytes, again, the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils all have a slightly different role in fighting disease. The neutrophils, the bacteria fighters, 
the eosinophils mediating uh, antiparasitic and allergic responses, the basophils mediating inflammation by the release of histamine. Okay, these are all part of what we call our nonspecific defenses, or what we might call our um, our innate immunity. Okay, and they serve as a first line of defense against disease. Our adaptive immunity, which is essentially our ability to generate chemical and physical attacks based on specific characteristics carried by a particular pathogen, are mediated by the macrophages and the lymphocytes. And those are the agranulocytes that we see down in the lower right-hand side of the panel. Okay? The monocytes will eventually become macrophages and the job of a macrophage basically is to eat things that are bad for you and things that are destroyed that are dying okay and in the case of pathogens or infected cells present the foreign antigens as a warning to the immune system that you have an infection okay the lymphocytes which come in two broad classes the B lymphocytes which mature in the bone marrow and the T lymphocytes which mature in the thymus, which is an organ behind the sternum and in front of the heart, they are responsible for the specific physical and chemical attack on the pathogen that ultimately renders it uh, useless. Um, the B lymphocytes produce molecules called antibodies that bind to infected cells or to pathogens and mark them for destruction. And the T lymphocytes come in three flavors, the regulatory T's, the helper T's, and the cytotoxic T's. The cytotoxic T's actually show up where infected tissue is located and destroy it using chemical attacks that either perforate the membrane or that cause the cell to commit suicide. Okay, um, The helper T cells stimulate the production of particular um, B and T cells designed to fight that strain of pathogen. Okay, so it picks out those lymphocytes that are going to be best at destroying your particular infection and it sends out chemical signals that magnify their numbers. Okay, and then the regulatory T's which will turn off the entire process once it's concluded. And so what you've got here is a chart showing you um, what each of these cells looks like, um, their average number per microliter, what they appear like on a blood smear, what their job is, and some other remarks. So what I want you to do is to go through this uh, chart in your book. Um, this is uh, figure 179. Uh, and know this material. This is very important because what I'll do on exams and quizzes is I'll show you pictures of these and I'll ask you questions about their different roles and you want to be able to describe them and draw them in some cases or at least recognize them in a figure. These are the agranulocytes again with the same bits of information um, traced out here in the chart. Okay the next topic we want to address is hemostasis and hemostasis is simply a series of processes that results in the halting of blood loss through damaged vessels like lacerations or punctures. It establishes also a framework for tissue repair and it's split into three phases but it's actually a cascade of events that consists of a vascular, a platelet, and a coagulation phase. Okay. Okay. Now the vascular phase of hemostasis lasts about a half hour post-injury the endothelial cells will contract in response to the injury and expose the basement membrane to the bloodstream. Endothelial cells release chemical factors and hormones and endothelians. These peptide hormones stimulate smooth muscle and promote vascular spasm. And this causes the vessel to choke down so that hemorrhaging is minimized. And it also stimulates the division of endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, and fibroblasts underneath in order to repair the wound. This accelerates the repair process. The endothelial plasma membranes become sticky, and the attachment of cells on either side of the tear in the vessel helps to partially seal it off. 
in the small capillary cells on opposite sides of the vessel can stick together and prevent blood flow in the damaged vessels. So essentially, because of extracellular matrix uh, damage due to the injury, formed elements begin to cling to the opening. Um, among those formed elements are the platelets, and as the platelets begin to accumulate, what they will do is begin to secrete chemical factors that will set into motion ultimately the production of a fibrin clot, which will in turn trap more, trap more formed elements in the injury and further reduce the amount of blood loss. Okay, So the first thing that happens, right, is that we have the injury, we expose these molecules that are normally covered by endothelial tissue and connective tissue, those exposed molecules are going to serve as attachment points for formed elements including platelets and then the platelets begin to release their chemical component. In the platelet phase what we see is attachment of the platelets to the sticky endothelial surface, the basement membrane and the exposed collagen fibers as well as other platelets. The chemicals that are released by the platelets and the damaged tissue um, include ADP, which stimulates platelet aggregation and secretion, chemicals that further promote vascular spasm, and platelet factors, which play a role in clotting. PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor, is going to promote vessel repair underneath the injury so that once the platelet plug and the clot are removed, we have new tissue underneath and further hemorrhaging is ended. Calcium ions are also secreted. They're required both for platelet aggregation, but they also promote the blood clotting process. So all of these are essentially the result of these platelets sticking and releasing their contents. Okay, You could think of them, in a sense, as bags of clotting factors, Okay, which will tilt the plasma proteins that are already going to contribute to coagulation to producing now the fibrin clot that will ultimately plug this hole in a more, on a more permanent basis while tissue repair is affected. This is just a look at the chemical process of coagulation, so take a listen. At the site of vessel injury, the first platelets arrive to start sealing the wound. Simultaneously, the coagulation cascade with its various coagulation factors is activated. This involves two pathways, the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway. Extrinsic activation begins with now exposed molecules of the vessel wall, such as tissue factor, which forms a complex with factor 7 finally leading to the activation of factor 10. This factor 10A is the point at which the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathways of the coagulation cascade meet. The intrinsic pathway consists of various coagulation factors activating each other in a chain reaction. At its end, a complex with an additional cofactor is formed. This complex now activates factor 10. Since the two pathways merge at the level of factor 10A, this factor has a pivotal role in the coagulation cascade. Further down the cascade, factor 10A in combination with 5A activates thrombin and induces the so-called thrombin burst. One molecule of factor 10A can catalyze the formation of a thousand molecules of thrombin. These large amounts of thrombin cause the further activation of platelets and the enhanced formation of fibrin. Fibrin then forms strands, making up the mesh that stabilizes the platelet plug in an arterial clot and holds together the red blood cells in a venous clot. It can be concluded that the central role of factor 10A in the coagulation cascade makes it a viable target for therapeutic intervention in pathologically altered blood coagulation.
So what we can see here with the coagulation cascade is a series of events that results in the production of a fibrin clot. Now what you'll notice here is that it's, it's a multi-step process depending on whether we're referring to the ex extrinsic, the intrinsic, or the common pathway. They all feed into activated factor 10 which converts prothrombin into thrombin which is critical because that converts the fibrinogen into fibrin um, and this is the main component of the clot. That's what helps to further trap formed elements and also to serve as a bridge work to completely stanch hemorrhaging and also sets the stage for tissue repair. The reason that this is a multi-step cascade is to magnify the initial event in order to generate now sufficient amounts of the end product that we can actually clog the injury. At each step in this cascade, more than one molecule can be activated downstream. So, for instance here, we have the stimulus of tissue damage. We're doing the extrinsic pathway branch here. This results in um, the production of activated tissue factor. Okay, And the activated tissue factor in the presence of calcium will produce activated clotting factor. But keep in mind that the activated tissue factor can activate more than one inactivated clotting factor which in turn can activate more than one um, other downstream tissue factor. Okay, And so the result of this multi-step process is that at each step we magnify the response. So it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until we reach a crescendo generating the fibrin that makes up the clot and ultimately now uh, resulting in complete blockage of the injury so that we don't bleed out. Okay. Another thing that results once we've generated the fibrin clot is a process of clot retraction where what happens is at the ends of the injury um, will begin to be drawn close together as a result of stimulation of smooth muscle and this makes it easier to bridge the gap and it also makes it easier to affect tissue repair. Okay. Now once the fibrin clot has served its purpose we can dissolve it and recycle the breakdown products and this is the process known as fibrinolysis. Plasminogen um, is activated to plasmin by a thrombin which is produced in the common pathway tissue plasminogen activator is released by damaged tissue and the plasmin erodes the clot and eventually what happens is the clot vanishes and the repaired tissue now takes the place of the, the damaged tissue. Okay, let's take a look at um, some clinical components here. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about blood disorders when we obtain blood for diagnosis we perform a procedure known as venipuncture which is the withdrawal of whole blood from a superficial vein. It's commonly used because it's easy to locate these veins. The walls tend to be thinner than arteries and venous blood pressure is low so it seals quickly and we don't hemorrhage as much. Most clinical procedures examine venous blood as a result. If you look at the organization of the human body one of the things that you come to appreciate is the fact that in general when, especially with regard to the systemic circulation, veins tend to be closer to the surface than arteries are. And this is a good design feature of the body because in the event of an injury, we're less likely to bleed out and the blood that we lose is in a sense less valuable because it has a lower oxygen and fuel content. It also makes it easier for hemostasis to set in. Okay. Let's talk about some nutritional blood disorders. Iron deficiency anemia is caused by insufficient iron intake or absorption. Okay? Um, we can have an error at either or both ends getting iron into the blood. The resulting red cells are microcytic and they transport less oxygen. 
This tends to be more common in women since their iron reserves are half that of the typical male. Now, one of the things we have to appreciate about this is the fact that in any anemia, if any part of the process of building a red blood cell is defective, we won't produce an effective red blood cell. In the case of iron deficiency, either as a result of a lack of iron in the diet or a lack of ability to absorb iron, if we don't have the iron, we can't build functioning hemoglobin because the iron is the business end of the heme molecule. It would be kind of like asking you to build um, a three-story building without um, any cement, right? It would be a very difficult thing to accomplish. You might have all the other building materials, but without the cement, you can't do anything. Pernicious anemia is a deficiency of B12 that prevents normal stem cell division in red bone marrow. B12 is critical for the manufacture of DNA. Fewer red cells are produced, and the resulting red cells are misshapen and macrocytic. This can result from a lack of intrinsic factor in the lining of the stomach, which is important for the transport of B vitamins into the blood. The protein which is secreted in the stomach is required for B12 absorption. People that lack this, that have pernicious anemia, generally have to get their B12 through uh, an intravenous injection. Clotting disorder, disorders can be caused by a lack of any of the clotting factors in the clotting cascade or by insufficient calcium or vitamin K. Calcium is required for all the clotting pathways, and vitamin K is important uh, because the liver needs it to synthesize the clotting factors that facilitate the production of the clot. Okay? Um, all of the factors which are made by the liver, including prothrombin, rely on the presence of vitamin K for this to work. Sickle cell anemia is a special type of anemia in which defective hemoglobin results in an impaired ability to carry oxygen in the body. This mutation results in an amino acid substitution in the beta subunit of hemoglobin under low oxygen concentration the hemoglobin forms polymers inside the red blood cell and this causes the red blood cell to adapt an unusual shape that of a sickle. Okay, If we were to draw it it would look a little bit like this let's use red as our color Okay. So let's imagine that this would be, you know, a normal red blood cell, okay, under low oxygen concentration, and a sickled red blood cell would look something like this. The reason it's called sickled is because there's a farm implement called a sickle that used to be used to harvest wheat, okay? If you've ever seen a picture of the Grim Reaper, his sickle is the instrument he uses to harvest souls, okay? So this would be an example of a sickled red blood cell. Sickled RBC. Okay. This causes the red blood cell to become more fragile. The sickled shape catches on capillary walls and blocks blood flow and this results now in a crisis. Okay. You can see more clearly here the sickled and the normal RBCs. Individuals with the disorder must have two copies of the sickling gene. Those that have only one copy will have what we call sickling trait, but will not have full-blown sickle cell anemia. And they'll also have an increased resistance to a parasitic disease called malaria. Um, infection of red blood cells by the malarial parasite causes them to sickle, and these cells get destroyed by the macrophages and the pathogen as a result is destroyed along with the RBC. So in a malarial environment having one copy of the sickle cell gene is actually advantageous. The problem came about when man created planes, trains, and automobiles and we took this gene out of its normal environment and <coughs> as a result in individuals that inherited two copies of the gene, when they experience a low oxygen situation, just such as exertion or high altitudes, we have the characteristic sickling that results in the clogging of capillaries and the choking off of blood from downstream tissues, not to mention the release of hemoglobin from these damaged, these sickled cells that results in damage to things like the liver and the spleen.
Okay, so very important that we understand this. Now, this is one of those conditions that we can screen for before the baby's born. If you know that you have sickle cell running in your family, we can use amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling to check the amniotic fluid of the baby prior to birth, and we can use a technique called PCR, where we amplify specific regions of DNA in a biological sample, and we can sequence that DNA, and we can tell the parent whether their child is either going to carry the sickle cell gene, will have full-blown sickle cell anemia, or will in fact be normal. Okay, we can check that. Okay, hemophilia is an inherited bleeding disorder, affects 1 in 10,000 births. Most of these are males, and the reason for this is that this condition is carried, in most cases, in most hemophilias, on the X chromosome. Remember that men only have one X chromosome, women have two X chromosomes, and since these conditions, these hemophilia conditions, are recessive, in order for the male to show it, he only needs one bad copy of the gene because the Y chromosome has no counterbalancing information to cover for mistakes on the X, whereas in a, in a female, she would have to have two bad copies of the gene, one on each X chromosome, in order for the condition to show up, and that's much less likely to happen in the general population. So it's caused by missing or reduced production of a clotting factor. The severity of the disorder varies um, depending on the defect in the gene. In some severe cases, we can have extensive bleeding, even with minor contact. Bleeding also tends to occur at joints and around muscles, basically areas where physical trauma will take place. And how many different types of hemophilias are there? Dozens and dozens, okay? And they all tend to affect males more than females. It's an interesting thing with the X chromosome. We should point out the fact that the X chromosome contains more information simply than just sexual identity, the production and maintenance of secondary sex characteristics, and um, the, the establishment of the primary sex characteristics, which is the presence of either testes or ovaries. There are body plan instructions in the X chromosome that affect all the body systems, and that's why you have to have at least one X chromosome to be a viable human being. And that's one of the reasons we never see an individual born with only a Y chromosome and no other sex chromosomes because that generally results in what we call an embryonic lethal where um, the, the baby won't develop much past what we call the morular or blastocyst stage. Okay, thalassemias are inherited disorders <clears throat> that are caused by the inability to adequately produce normal hemoglobin. The severity depends on which and how many protein subunits are abnormal. An example of a thalassemia might be an individual that inherits a hemoglobin gene that um, only produces half the hemoglobin chain, okay, or um, produces no hemoglobin as a result of lacking regulatory components in the gene. These are all possibilities. So what do we do about these different disorders? Well, in the case of an inherited disorder, there's not a lot we can do. Um, we can manage, in some cases, with transfusion, but other than that, there's no way to go in and correct the genetic mistake. We're not, we're not to that level yet. If we're talking about infections, though, we do have methods to prevent or reduce the effects that are generated as a result of exposure to pathogens. Blood infections are caused by pathogens entering the blood through a wound or through an infection. Bacteremia is bacteria circulating in the blood um, but not multiplying there, while viremia are viruses that circulate in the blood but do not multiply. Okay? Sepsis is widespread pathogenic infection of body tissue. Septicemia is sepsis of the blood where we have essentially blood poisoning as a result of pathogens being present and multiplying in the blood and spreading. One of the major causes of things like septicemia is a, an organism called Staphylococcus aureus, which is a normal 
um, bacteria that lives on our skin but can occasionally penetrate through a wound and get into the bloodstream and once there if it's if it slides past our nonspecific immunity it can cause tremendous damage if it gets into the bloodstream and this is why the body takes special care to protect us against the outside world using our nonspecific defenses such as inflammation and the action of granulocytes as well as the presence of our body coverings like our skin and mucous membranes and their secretions okay um, all of which are supposed to cut down now on the number of pathogens that do manage to penetrate into the deeper tissues and potentially get into the bloodstream but this is one of the reasons why um, we worry about extensive injury where we expose deep tissues to the outside world we worry about infection of the blood because we've opened up something that normally isn't exposed to the pathogens in our environment to um, the the microbes that are around us all the time in the air we breathe in the food we eat in the water that we drink okay malaria is a parasitic disease caused by plasmodium which is a protozoan it kills around two million people annually half of them under the age of five it's transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito it initially affects the liver but it eventually fragments um, and infects red blood cells periodically um, the red blood cells will rupture and release parasites and hemoglobin and we'll see cycles of fever and chills that correspond to these release the dead red cells block the vessels to vital organs and it causes those organs to die and remember we indicated that if you carry one copy of the gene for sickle cell anemia you have a resistance to this infection in this case they call this um, a balanced polymorphism meaning that um, as a result of selective conditions in that environment it's a good idea to have one copy of this quote-unquote bad gene in order to produce now resistance to this particular disease state okay blood cell cancers uh, include things like leukemias these are cancers of the white cells and of the blood forming tissues the cancerous cells spread throughout the body from their origin in marrow the first symptoms appear with the presence of immature and abnormal white cells in circulation it's fatal if untreated the reason this is a big problem is because the white cells produced in leukemia are not immunocompetent, meaning they have a reduced ability to fight disease, and so the individual ends up being more susceptible to cancer and infection because you're clogging the system with cells that are incapable of producing an immune response. In addition to that, we also have to appreciate the fact that the cancer cell, as all cancer cells will do, will take the lion's share of oxygen and nutrients from functioning tissue and this will eventually result in cell and tissue death and organ shutdown if untreated. So let's talk about some of these leukemias. There's two main types, myeloid leukemia which is characterized by the presence of abnormal granulocytes or other bone marrow cells and lymphoid leukemia which involves lymphocytes and their stem cells and so here you can see some abnormal white cells um, indicated by the little red dots there in a blood smear of a patient with myeloid. Notice the abnormal shapes, the unusual nuclei, and so on. All essentially physical indicators of a lack of immunocompetence. Okay, disseminated intravascular coagulation is the result of bacterial toxins that activate the plotting process all over the body. This converts too much fibrinogen to fibrin, and small clots appear in tiny vessels. The phagocytes in the plasma work to remove the fibrin, and the liver works to keep the fibrinogen at adequate levels. The result is often uncontrolled bleeding that can occur because we've essentially removed all the fibrinogen, producing clots that are completely unnecessary. So in a disease in which we have excessive clotting, Oddly enough, it's often characterized by excessive bleeding. And you can appreciate 
in a sense, if I were to draw an analogy, um, let's say that uh, you were working on a construction crew and um, for some reason um, half the members of your crew thought it was a good idea to, um, to cement all the bricks together in a big pile and, and not contribute to the structure that you're building. Okay, The result is going to be a, a, a weakened structure, a weakened building, or a weakened house. And the same thing is happening here with this DIC. You're removing the fibrinogen from its normal role by wasting it, making clots that are unnecessary, and the result then is excessive bleeding. Okay, um, this brings us to the end of our first podcast. Um, there's going to be uh, at least a couple more to follow this term. You are responsible for this material. I want you to um, listen to this podcast and take notes just as if you were attending lecture. You will be tested on this material. It's going to show up in the exams and also in the in-class quizzes. If you have any questions about this material, um, talk to me during lab or during my tutoring time, uh, and we will try and iron out any areas of confusion for you. Um, in addition, you should also appreciate the fact that your homework will address a lot of the content in this chapter as well. Okay, um, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'll see everybody in class. Thanks a bunch.